1 Samuel 17. I know I'm not supposed to be looking for signs. <laughs> but Pastor Gorski was sitting across from me this morning with a t-shirt that said, Is There Not a Cause? Oh. And Brother Max preached last night and had the same t-shirt on. <laughs> and that's the title of my message. <laughs> so we're going to read 1 Samuel 17. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Just, I'd like to draw some, some illustrations from the story of David and Goliath that will be an encouragement to you for personal victory in your life against your giant for the glory of God. And I'd like to end with a reminder of the final victory that Jesus will have over the enemy. 1 Samuel 17, we'll read verse 1 through verse 3. And then if I could please have Brother Gene Kim pray for the message. Now... The Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Deimim. You say, preacher, I didn't know how those were pronounced. I didn't know that's how those were pronounced either. <laughs> Verse 2, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Preacher. Yes. And that it will be washed away, and that we will be renewed within our mm -hmm. hearts and within our minds. Have the Holy Spirit, Lord, so within our hearts, convict us, change us, transform us into better lives where we will be pleasing to you, and so fill within your speaker the power of your Holy Spirit, because in order for you to accomplish this task, you chose preachers to do this. Yes. So I pray, Heavenly Yes. And I pray that we can sense you speaking to us yes. and that you will get the glory after the preaching. Please, Lord. You will be well pleased and honored. May this be an incense, a sacrifice that oh, yes. to heaven, that you will find favor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, this is a story that I'm sure you've heard. Many of you know it. You've learned it in Sunday school. And so I'd like to just take another look at this story here again, this Battle between David and Goliath. Now first, let's start with the setup for the battle, which is found in verse 1 through verse 3. Notice that this battle takes place in verse 1 in Shoko, and this, notice it says, which belongeth to Judah. Which belongeth to Judah. Now this is not uh, Israel going into Philistines' territory to pick a fight. This is the Philistines coming into Israel's territory to pick a fight. And they show up, and the place they show up belongs to Judah. Now when they show up, they show up, and you've got both sides that are up on these mountains. You've got, here are the Philistines over here, and they're with all their might and all their power, and they're set up, and they've got their shields and their spears, and of course they have their champion, and they just know that they are going to defeat Israel. And here's Israel over here, and they've got Saul, and they've got all these mighty men, and of course Israel is looking to Saul to fight their battle for them because that's the whole reason why they picked him in the first place. And now they're on two mountains. But notice that the battle does not take place up on the mountain. The battle takes place down in the valley, and it takes place in Israel's territory. And what I want to tell you is you're up here on a mountain right now. But the battle is going to take place when we go down into the valley, and it's going to take place in your territory. The battle is going to show up in your church. 
The battle is going to show up in your home. And if that's not close enough, as the preacher preached to you yesterday, the battle will show up in your mind. You won't ask for the battle. You won't start the battle. The battle will come to you. But bless God, let's finish it. <laughs> now the next thing, notice we have the sighting of the giant. In verse 4 down through verse 8. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Now notice we have the sighting of the giant. Now when this giant comes out, the Bible describes him with a word that I think we are all very familiar with. He is called a champion. That is what he is called a champion. He is the champion of the Philistines. Now, in order for a man to become a champion, that means that he has had to have defeated other men in the past. So when Goliath stands up there, he stands up as a champion. He stands up with battle scars. He stands up knowing that if you do this, he'll do this. He has taken on many men before. Many mighty men have come up and flexed their muscles and beat their chest to this great man. But he has come out the champion. And so here this champion stands with gnarled teeth and one of those, uh, what do they call it, ears when a boxer gets hit? What do they call it? Call flower ear and he's got scars and his breast stinks and flies are buzzing around and he stands up and he's muscular he is the champion he has defeated many men before he has taken down better men than you and me but brothers and sisters there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but God is faithful there he stands there, the champion. Can't you see him? Oh, what a fearful sight. I imagine when he comes walking down, he is a legend in his own mind. And the Philistines are behind him saying, <laughs> There he goes. Down he walks and his armor is rattling and shaking. And I think to myself, in his mind, the ground shook. But I don't think the ground shook, but the Israelites definitely shook. They're over here going, oh man, what are we going to do? And down walks that champion into the valley. And like he needed help, he gets a guy to go down there with him carrying his shield. I mean, if it wasn't enough that the champion went down there, why does he need somebody to help him down there into the valley? But down he goes. Can't you see him? Oh, he is a scary sight. He is powerful. Notice here in the text, he requires a man. He says in verse 9, If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will be, we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants. Here's the sighting of this champion. He requires a man for him to fight against he wants a powerful man to come and fight he wants a man to come and stand against him and ladies and gentlemen he's been saying this now when we get into our story for 40 days for 40 days he'd been saying the same thing and Israel's back here and they're saying oh man again the champions got to come out again why won't it just go away why won't he just disappear? Why won't this giant just go away? Why is it that every day, day in and day out, I got to walk out and I got to see that giant? And I got to see him every day and he says the same thing. And he says, give me a man that we may fight together. Why do I have to see it? You know, Goliath, Goliath, you know what he said? He lies. He says, why are you come out to set your battle in array? That's what, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Isn't that what it says? Let me make sure it says it. <laughs> yeah, verse 8. Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? But they didn't come out. Verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. 
You know what your giant's going to do? Your giant's going to say, ah, this is all you. It's all your fault. You're the reason why I'm here. The giant picked the fight. Why are you come out to fight? Now, as we said before, David didn't start this fight, but he's going to finish it. Amen. Now, notice the stipulations for the fight. He says in verse 9, if he, if he be able, this man, to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye should be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, Goliath wants a man to fight, and, but he qualifies it. He wants an able man. You know, it says, if he be able. If he be able. You know what Goliath is looking for? Goliath is looking for an able man. Did you know what Moses' father-in-law wanted him to look for? He wanted him to look for able men. Do you know why he wanted him to look for able men? Because he told Moses, you're not able to do this. But I want to tell you something. Goliath was looking for a man. And God always has his man. Oh, yeah. Woo! You take, for example, Moses. Moses is there and he's 80 years old. By this time, he should be going out into retirement. And the Lord says, you know, I need somebody who can lead Israel out of the wilderness. I can lead Israel out of Egypt and take him into the wilderness. And about that time, Michael the archangel shows up and says, you know, Lord, I've been watching this young guy over here. And I tell you what, man, he's been lifting weights and he's been practicing jujitsu. And I tell you, he learns three different languages and he's got a college scholarship. And the Lord says, nah, nah, I don't want him. I don't want him. He's too able. <laughs> About that time, it says, well, Lord, I tell you what, I know this group over here. And this group over here, they've got this underground thing going, and they've got this militia, and they are ready to rise up against the Egyptian government and overthrow it. And they've got all the swords, and they've got all the, all the might ready to go. Lord, here's a group over here. Nah, they're too able. <laughs> he says, I got just the guy. <laughs> About that time, he shows up in a burning bush, and Moses turns aside to see it. <laughs> And Michael says, him? <laughs> the Lord always has his man. You take old Gideon. Gideon's there, and finally he gets that whole army together, and Gideon's thinking to himself, yeah, now we can do something with this. Look at all these people. And the Lord says, nah, this, you're too able. And he whittles that thing back till they only have 300. <laughs> the Lord always has his man. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we are not able, but he is able. Now notice the scare of the challenge, the scare of the challenge. In verse 11, it says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now these men were greatly afraid. I mean, do you realize that better men than these uh, than these soldiers have tried to whip Goliath and they've been beaten? I mean, that's why he's the champion. He's the champ. I mean, imagine if all of a sudden we had, uh, I don't know, Floyd Mayweather walk in here and say, I'll challenge any one of you. Or Mike Tyson, walk, I'll challenge every one, any one of you. What are you going to do? Say, man, he's beat up a whole lot better guys than me. How in the world am I going to fight against him? And here's all Israel on their back and they're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm never going to get victory over that giant. <laughs> you ever thought that? <laughs> Oh my goodness, that giant has beaten, defeated so many other people. I'm never going to get victory. Look at that thing. Oh my goodness, look at it. I can't, I can't take that thing on. It's, it's beaten better men than me. You see, the problem with the children, with those mighty men, these were mighty men of valor. The problem with them was misplaced fear. You see, they had a fear of man. If you fear man, you won't fear God. But if you fear God, you won't fear man. Let's continue. Now notice the summer camp. Well, hold on. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> notice the submission of the children. Now in verse 12, David shows up. It says, Now David, the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, 
whose name was Jesse, had eight sons, and the man went among men for old men in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest, notice, followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Notice the submission of the children. Notice they are following two different things. Notice these three eldest sons that are probably more qualified than David. I mean, they're the older boys. As a matter of fact, when Samuel came to anoint a king out of Jesse's sons, they got all the boys together, but left David out there in the field with the sheep. And they actually went through the lineup two times before Samuel had to look at Jesse and say, is this all your boys? And Jesse goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, we got one. <laughs> That's David, but he's, he's watching the sheep. <laughs> Why in the world would you want him? He's watching the sheep. They said, you bring him. When he came in, the Lord said, that's the guy that I've chosen. Did you notice who the boys followed? They followed Saul. David didn't follow Saul. He returned from Saul and went back to a bunch of sheep. As a matter of fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord says to David, when I took you, I took you from following sheep. Instead of following Saul, he followed some sheep. You know what it is over here with sheep? Whenever we want to see a, like, a, like an Anna Green Gables type of scenery that's just so nice and calm, you know one of the things they always show? They always show some sheep running across, and here's this shepherd just following. It's just nice and peaceful and calm, right? Isn't that what you see? Yeah. But you know what? Where, 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 where the boys were, where the three eldest were, they were with Saul. You know, when they're with Saul, that's where the action's taking place. That's where there's a lot of noise, but no victory. That's where there's a lot of movement, but nothing's getting done for God. That's where there's a lot of shouting and running, but there's no power. That's where they are. But where's David? He's off here in a quiet place. And he's over here just sitting here watching these sheep, playing his harp. And all of a sudden he goes, <coughs> Oh, that's good. And he reaches over and he gets his little Hebrew iPad out. <laughs> and he says, takes his stylus and says, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. I shall not want. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to have strength to fight the giant, you're going to have to spend time in quiet. Everybody wants to be where the action is. Can I give you just a small piece of advice, especially if you want to get in the ministry? Yeah, I'm giving you this my personal experience. Don't, don't get so busy come on, come on. This is good doing things for God that you forget to spend time with God. Amen. Don't rely on your talent to get you through because it will only go so far you won't have the victory over the giant if all you're depending upon is your talent you won't have the power of God if all you depend on is that you are head and shoulders above the rest of the people if you want the power of God, if you want the victory over the giant, you better take time and quiet and spend it with the sheep and the shepherd. Amen. What are you following? What do you give your time to? Now let's notice the summer camp experience. Verse 16 in the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. So while David is back here for 40 days with the sheep, here are all these guys over here and all the action has taken place. Let me get this across to you. 
It is never a waste to spend time in quiet with the shepherd when the action is taking place. Do you understand? Quit trying to just keep everything generating, keep everything going. Because a lot of guys are doing that. They're doing it for 40 days and nobody's defeating that giant. But here's a shepherd boy just in the quiet, spending time with his sheep and his shepherd. And he's the one who gets the victory. Now watch what happens. This is critical. And Jesse, verse 17, and Jesse said unto David, his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. And look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. Notice the summer camp experience because if you noticed in verse, uh, well, where does it say he went to the camp? I just saw it. Thank you. In 17, he goes to the camp. <laughs> All right, so there's the summer camp experience. Now David was told, I want you to go and I want you to see how your brothers are doing. You see, David was over here. His brothers are over there. You know what we're doing? We've been all over this great state of California. <laughs> Sorry, Brother Walker. <laughs> you know what we're doing? We're all coming together. See how the brothers are doing. When we get in here, and man, how's the fight been going? Man, you know what we're doing? We're shouting. We're shouting for the battle. Now, the battle's taking place down the valley. But we're up here and we're shouting for the battle. He was in the trench. He went to the trench. You know what's in the trench? In the trench, like the trench warfare, there's relative safety in the trench. The battle, they have to come up out of the trench and go down there and fight, you know. But there's safety in the trench. Man, here we are. We're up here at summer camp. There's safety up here. I would imagine a lot of the temptations that you've been fighting down there in the valley, you really haven't had to fight them that much up here. I mean, it's been great. You've been shouting, you've been screaming, you've been hollering, you've been singing, you know, hail to thee. I mean, it's been great, right? You've been enjoying yourself. Then we're going to get down there and we're going to see how each other's doing. And we're going to hear the testimonies. And oh, I love to hear the testimonies. I like to hear what God has done for people. I mean, you hear one brother and you hear the testimony of what God brought him out of and what we have people coming out of cults and we have uh, uh, people on drugs and uh, people who never went to any of that, praise God, and they got saved young. Uh, we hear people uh, 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 of, of, of different backgrounds and different cultures. Man, we hear, we hear all these different things, all these different testimonies. You know, I... I wish I could sum all these testimonies up for you. What would these testimonies be like? I think if I were to describe them, I'd have to describe them like this. Heartache yeah. and misery were both well known to me. I didn't know the meaning of peace and living free. But one day something happened that changed my whole life. I met a man called Jesus, and now I'm satisfied. I lived oh so wicked, my life was but a shame. I didn't have a thing to show, not even my good name. But one day something happened, and now I've been set free from a life of sin and heartache since Jesus came to me. And now I'm satisfied, I'm satisfied, yes I'm satisfied, on my knees.
is on the altar where to the Lord I cried. Oh, he cleaned up my heart and he opened my eyes ever since I met Jesus. I've been satisfied. Does that sum up the testimonies? Are you satisfied in Jesus Christ? Thank you, Lord. That's the summer camp experience. While he's at summer camp, he hears some things. After Israel comes in from the battle, verse 22 down to verse 27. Goliath makes his debut. And this is the first time that David hears it. Verse 22, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of, Goliath, of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now notice the first time that he hears Goliath. And what he hears is two things. He hears a reproach, but he hears a reward. He hears the reproach that this man has said against the armies of the living God. But then he also hears about a reward. You know what you've heard? You've heard about the reproach of sin. You've heard about that. And you've heard about what it has done to people's lives. But you have also heard from the preachers this week that there is a reward for standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard a reproach. You've heard a reward. Let's move on. Notice verse 28 to 29, the false accusations against David. And Eliab, his eldest brother, Heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? <laughs> now here's Eliab, it's the oldest brother, the eldest brother, and he starts bringing some accusations against uh, David. And really what he attacks is he attacks David's motive for even being there. And he says, you don't even have the right motive. I mean, here you are and you're out here and you're just asking all these things because you're just full of pride. That's all you are. You're just full of pride. You just, all you want is you want people to pat you on the back. That's all you're looking for. You're just so, you're so proudful. I know you. I know you. And David steps back and he goes, is there not a cause? <laughs> You ever been like that? You ever been down in prayer? You've been crying out to the Lord, say, Lord, I got this, there's this giant down there. And I just came down after hearing the preachers and I got down an altar. And as you're down on the altar, say, Lord, there's a giant that I got to go back and I got to face. And Lord, when I get down, that thing's going to be there and I'm asking you to please give me victory over that thing. And Lord, I really would like to do some great things for you. I mean, I really would like to take some ground for you. I, I'd really like to finish well. I, I mean, Lord, give me that second win like a run in a race. I really want to do something for you. I want people to see you working in my life. Am I the only one who's prayed that? But then am I the only one who's all of a sudden had some thought come in from the back of my mind and says, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. I know you, you just stand up there and you want to sing for these people, but I know you, you're just, you think you're somebody, don't you? I mean, you can tell some stories and get them all fired up, and Gene Kim said, you are a top ten of his preachers. I know your pride and naughtiness of thine heart. Am I the only one who's in the middle of prayer had all of a sudden these thoughts come in? 
that begin to challenge my motives for the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know how you handle them. Here's how I handle them. I just say, Lord, that's true. I do think I'm a good singer. And I think I can tell good stories. And I think it's pretty cool that Gene Kim said I'm in his top ten. But Lord, I confess that is a sin because that's my flesh talking. And I ask that you please bring my thoughts into captivity to Christ. Take that stronghold of pride. And in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, destroy it. And instead, Lord, build in its place humility. Because, Lord, I'm nothing without you. These are your vocal cords. Lord, you can make me look like an idiot in front of these people if you wanted to. I don't want to, but you could do it. And if that's what please you, then make me look like an idiot. Because, Lord, you deserve the glory. And my flesh just needs to shut up. David looks at his brother and says, is there not a cause? Ladies and gentlemen, he was fighting for something that was much bigger than himself. He was fighting for something that dealt with the Lord's glory. This guy came out and defied the armies of the living God. David says, is there not a cause? Oh, yes, my friend, there's a cause. I won't brag on the Lord. Do you realize who we're fighting for? We're fighting for someone who said, who has measured the waters in the palm of his hand? And who hath measured the heavens with a span? Who can comprehend the dust of the earth? You know what we are before him? All flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. God stands up and lifts his his arm to heaven and says, I am God, and I am God alone. And beside me, there is no other. That's who we serve. We do not serve some stupid little idol that could not rescue itself if it was in danger. If a fire broke out in the donut shop down the street from my house, as the flames began to rip through, he would sit there with a smile on his face and melt. But my God can take three Hebrew boys into a fire and bring them back out again. (laughs) That's who we serve. Now notice, we must hurry, the arguments of Saul. Verse 30 it says, and he turned from one to another, so he's looking from each guy to each guy, and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And verse 30 Two, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thou art not able. Please look back at verse 9. That is Goliath speaking. Saul has been listening to the enemy. David's been listening to the Lord. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, but he a man of war from his youth. Now here is David, and he comes before Saul. Saul tells him, Look, you're not able to do it. I realize things are exciting in camp, and I realize we shout, and this is great, and we need these times. But Saul says, You don't understand something. You don't have the skill and ability. You don't have what it takes when you get down there to defeat this giant. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, that's what your flesh is telling you. 
You don't have the ability. And can I just put your mind at ease? You really don't have the ability. <laughs> but God is able to make you able to do it. The Bible says, follow me and I will make you. See that? He's able to make you. Now in verse 34 through 37, let's read this very quickly. Notice David's ability is not in himself, but in his God. Now for sake of time, because I want to speed up, David recalls his past victories. And when he recalls those past victories, he knows that it's the Lord that gave him those past victories. As a matter of fact, this is very important. Notice in verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Notice David knew how he got the victories. You see, Goliath is another battle that he has to face. But he's already had battles in the past. Now I'm preaching exactly, you know where I'm going because you heard it preached before. You need to realize God has already given you victories in the past. That's why you have smaller victories and the victories get bigger and the victories get bitter, bigger and the battles get stronger and harder. But God can give you victory in each one. Before it was a lion, before it was a bear. But in each instance, David knew who gave him the victory. Do you know who gave you the victory to stop uh, to, to, to read the Bible every single day. I mean, some of you have struggled with reading the Bible every day. And then some of you, all of a sudden, now you've noticed that six months have gone by and you've actually read it every single day. Yeah. And you're like, wow, you know, who gave you the victory. The Lord gave you the victory. Yeah. Do you know why the rest of you are not having victory? Because you keep trying in the flesh. Yeah. You figure yeah. all you need is a better plan. Uh -huh. All you need is a better time of day. All, all you need, all you need is the Lord. Amen. Maybe you should start saying, Lord, help me. Amen. You know what Saul forgot? Saul forgot who gave the victory. In 1 Samuel 11 and verse 13, when Saul had gotten his first victory, he refused to kill anybody because he said the Lord had given victory that day. Saul forgot where the victory came from. Not David. David knew where the victory came from. Can I tell you what the challenge is going to be? Once you start getting some victories in your life, all of a sudden you're going to come along and say, man, I got this. <laughs> no, you don't, Saul. You hear me, Saul? You had a victory in the past. Remember when you were humble? Remember that, Saul? Remember when you trusted in the Lord, Saul? Remember when you said, oh, no, the Lord got the victory. Thank God for what he did in my life. Remember that, Saul? But now you've gotten big in your own eyes, haven't you, Saul? You're a little too big for your britches, Saul. Now the pride has come up into your heart, Saul. You had a victory before. Look at all these people that are following you. Saul, you will never get another victory if you try to do it in the flesh. Amen. David remembered where the victory came from. It came from the Lord. Now notice verse 38. Through verse 40, Saul tries to help David out. In verse 38, it says, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head, upon his head and armed him with a coat of mail. Now it says in the, verse 39 that he essayed to go. David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. I didn't know what essayed meant, so I had to look up the dictionary. And it means examined, according to Webster, examined, tested, proved by experience. So he essayed to go, uh, but he had not proved it. So notice how you have the word proved right there to tell you what essayed means. Thank God for a built-in dictionary in the King James Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, keep the NIVs. We'll take King James. <laughs> so here he is. He gets this armor on. Now, I know I'm preaching long. Keep hanging with me. He gets there, and he's got on this helmet, and he's got on all this stuff. It's all Saul's stuff, and he's clanking around it. He's trying to, he's like, let me test this thing out a little bit, you know. It's like, man, this just doesn't work, you know. <laughs> it's just, I just, man, I can't do this. I just, I can't do it. You know, I got to go with what I know. And what I know is, all I know is this little slingshot here and these, these stones and this staff. That's really all I know. I'm a shepherd. I'm not a warrior like you. I got to go in my, in my fight. You know what would be so great? <laughs> It'd be so great if I could just take Dr. Walker, Gene Kim, Randy Gorski. If I could just, hey, hey, I, I have some 
giants I have to go fight. Can you come with me? I need, I need to go along. And all of a sudden, giant comes up, and I go, oh, Brother Walker, how do I handle this? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Here's how I handle it. Boom. Boy, it sure would be nice if I could just have him stand there, you know, and just kind of tell me how to fight it, you know, you know. Did you see that, that punch he did the other day? You know, he turned yeah. up, you know, I, don't know, I don't know how he did it, man. I mean, don't fight me, please, you know. He even did a kick, you know. I was like, that guy knows what he's doing. You know? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have these guys? All, all of a sudden, I'm standing there, I knock on the door, knock on the door. Somebody answers the door, and they know what they're talking about. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Dr. Gene Kim, come here, come here, come here, come here. <clears throat> Continue. <laughs> Boy, that would be nice, wouldn't it? That would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine if I was trying to exposit a scripture? I'd just go get Randy Gorski and say, hey, come help me. Gene Kibb said he was the best expositor. <laughs> the preachers are going home to fight their own battles. You're going home to fight your own battles. You can't fight it the way they fight it. You have to have your walk with God yes. and fight the battle the way the Lord's showing you how to fight it. Yes. With the tools he's given you, yes. with the skills he's given you, with the talents he's given you, you just submit them all to the Lord and say, Lord, they are yours. Yes. Help me in this fight against the giant. Now he goes down into battle. From verse 41 down to verse 47, Goliath is insulted. All of a sudden, out walks David. Now Goliath apparently is sitting down because it says, I think around verse 47, that he arose, that he arose. So it appears that Goliath is sitting down. And all of a sudden, here comes David out. Goliath looks around and uh, what's the word? I think disdained. He disdained him. I think that's the word. He looked about and he disdained him. He saw this kid coming out. I mean, he looks up and he sees Josiah walking up. And he looks around like this and he says, you have got to be kidding me. I asked for a man and this is what you send me? You send me a boy? I was looking for a man. I was looking for somebody who was able. Out walks David and he looks there at that giant. Man, Goliath, just the rage, just begins to boil up inside of him. The vein pops out of his neck and out of his forehead. And he says, let me tell you something, you little whippersnapper. I'm going to take you and rip you to shreds. I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David stood there without Blinking with nerves of steel, looked that giant right in his eye and said, you come to me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Goliath says, Psh. that's in the original Hebrew. Psh. Are you kidding me? Then he begins to curse him by his gods. He says, I call upon Baal and curse you. And I curse you by Astaroth. And I curse you by Tagon. And I curse you by the Pope. And I curse you by Allah. Yeah. David said, is that all you got? You're going to need a lot more than that, buddy. And Goliath says, man, you seem a little confident, you little whippersnapper. Do you realize the power and might that I have on my side? And David says, do you realize the power and might that I have on my side? And Goliath said, all right, I want you to demonstrate for me what it would be like for your God to fight my gods. David said, watch. <laughs> like dropping a handkerchief. <laughs> David looks at Goliath and says, not only is he going to give me the victory, but he's going to get the glory. Amen. You see, if you can get victory over your giant, if you'll trust the Lord, he'll get the glory. 
he'll get the glory. Notice from verse 48 down to verse 54, Goliath is incapacitated. <laughs> says about David, uh, verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose, looks like he was sitting down, and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Man, isn't that courage? Oh, yeah. Don't we take great courage in that? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's like, let's go, man. <laughs> let's go. And he's sprinting towards him. And as he's running towards him like this, he's got that old slingshot and he reaches in. <laughs> man, out goes that, that, that stone and it goes <laughs> flying like a missile through the air. And here comes Goliath. Ah! <laughs> Now it says, do you, guys know, do you guys know which side Goliath fell on? He fell on his face. <laughs> Do you see that in the text? He fell on his face. <laughs> so I imagine that he's moving forward like this. And all of a sudden the Lord just kind of goes, bam. And then as soon as he hits his forehead, I imagine the Lord goes, on the back of his head. So Goliath goes, <laughs> Down on the ground he goes. Man, old David runs over there. He gets that sword out. And he takes that thing up and whack! Cuts off his head like that. Takes that head dripping with blood. Holds that massive, gnarly, tooth, stinky-faced man. Holds it up like that. Goliath's sword on the other side. Yeah! <laughs> Man, all those Israelites back in the back, they're saying to themselves, Yeah! <laughs> and those Philistines on the other side go, Run! <laughs> I'm almost done. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He gets the victory. God gets the glory. 2 Corinthians 4, I was reading this one day in verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I've read that verse numerous times, quoted it numerous times, and I know that I'm supposed to be renewed day by day, but what struck out, stuck out to me is the word cause. And I connected that with David saying, is there not a cause? And it says, for which cause? And I thought to myself, oh man, what is this cause? And then I backed up to the previous verse, and at the end of the verse, it talks about the glory of God. The overarching cause in the Christian's life is God's glory. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God conclusion I'd like to say this there is another fight that is greater than any one person it started in a garden about 6,000 years ago and plunged the human race into sin without asking I was born into this fight and I was going to go to hell the giant was too big for me to handle on my own. And one day, a man showed up who happened to be from Bethlehem. And he went to Calvary. He didn't look like much, but he humbled himself, laid aside his royal robes, took on the form of a servant, servant was made in the likeness of men, you say, why did he do all that? Well, he needed to try to make it a fair fight. All principalities and powers rallied against him to try to destroy him. I watched this man after living a sinless life for 33 and a half years. As he descended from Mount Zion down into the valley of the shadow of death. And as the bulls of Bashan began to compass him about 
And as the help of heaven withdrew, and he cried, I thirst, and then finally gave up the ghost. I watched as his body lay limp on the cross. They took it down, buried him. And there he was for three days and three nights until he rose again. But I turned back to the valley after he left. And as I saw him rise to the skies and heard those words, I'm coming back. My heart, with groanings which cannot be uttered, said, Even so, come Lord Jesus. And I turned back around and looked down in that valley. And saw there was the giant. He was destroying lives. And killing people. Wanting to send souls to hell. And each day. As the battle was set in array. The souls of men. Slipped off into hell. And I was filled with fear. And I almost lost hope. Then one day, in my haste, I said, does Jesus care? And I heard that song that we all know, does Jesus care? And I like the chorus that says, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. And I said, how do you know he cares? How do you know? Somebody said, you can read about it. Here in this book. And I began to thumb through these pages. And as I read these pages and began to learn more, I realized that the fight is not over. The outcome has already been decided. I began to take courage. And I was told to stop looking at the giant. And I was told to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I read more, but not only was I to look to him, but I was to look for him. And I found out that one day he would take me out of here. And I'd get home to be with him. But the fight would still not be over. And I imagined for just a moment as I read across those pages, that I was transported up to the third heaven. And I was standing there on Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Man, the judgment seat of Christ had already taken place. Now the tears have been shed, but now the bride has come through that thing and Now she has on these white robes. And I imagine for just a moment, if you would please just indulge me for a few more moments, that the captain of our salvation stood on the precipice of heaven and called for his horse. And as he mounted upon that steed, he pulled those reins and said, Soldiers, it's time. This is what you have been waiting for all this time. This is what you've been singing about. This is the moment of anticipation. And like no other general, Patton could never give a speech like him. Rommel could never approach his greatness. Jesus Christ sits there with the glory of all the ages wrapped around his shoulders with the crowns of many saints upon his head, with a sword upon his side and a name written the Word of God. He says, soldiers, it is time. Man, my heart begins to beat inside of me. I think it's about to pound out of my chest. And I say, tell me more. And he says, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you more. Because ladies and gentlemen, this world has been blaspheming my name. 
for the ages. They, like Goliath, have defied me. But let me tell you who I am. And we say, tell us. And he says, I am the Rose of Sharon. I am the Ancient of Days. I'm the Lily of the Valley. I'm the Bright and Morning Star. I am the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm the Captain of your salvation. I'm the Good Shepherd. I'm the Door. That's me. And about that time, he looks at us and he says, Are you ready? But with all my might, I want to say something, but I can't say anything. I'm speechless. I feel like it's choked inside. You ever know when you want to say something, but you can't? And all of a sudden, I hear a voice. It's a familiar voice, but it's not quiet. It's not soft. I've heard that voice before. I've heard that voice. And all of a sudden, I look over and I hear, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high His royal banner. It must not suffer loss From victory unto victory His army shall He lead Till every foe is vanquished And Christ is Lord indeed Ladies and gentlemen, you know how it ends. It ends with not the enemy feeding our flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field, but with Jesus Christ feeding their flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. So take heart, Christian soldier. We know how it ends. Live every day for the glory of God because one day the whole earth will be full of His glory. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message. In Jesus' name, amen.